What is up? Welcome to Listen for Commands, episode two. Episode two. Unfortunately, I had it on myself before, so it's gonna have to start on me this time. But we got Dante in the building. What's up? Unfortunately, no Georgie. No we Georgie are this time. On the verge of tears, obviously. It's not a show without Georgie, but... I almost didn't wake up this morning because of it. <laughs> but we have to persist. We have to move on. That's what you would want. <laughs> so, why am I talking about it like that? Yeah, she's just... Uh, she's back home, so she cannot join us for today. But that's all, that's all good. We actually have quite a few topics. Well, we have a few topics to talk about, but they're all relating to the same kind of uh, same kind of thing. Which, uh, do you want to introduce it or should I? Yeah, today we're going to be talking a little bit about considerations for collegiate power lifters uh, under the realm of stress, nutrition, and etc. Um, yeah, like dieting, uh, like your diet, stress, uh, largely just like what is most difficult for students already. But then how do you... Uh, focus on that and focus on diet, which is a very big part of powerlifting while in school worrying about classes and stress of grades and all that fun stuff. So I think to start, do you have any like stories or anything you want to like talk about for your yourself like regarding this? Yeah, I was kind of thinking uh, it's best to kind of give an overview of what my experience has been, you know, as somebody as a powerlifter who's struggled a lot with trying to get my weight to the right place. Um, I just wanted to say that, like, I don't know. I've, over the past year, I've been struggling to get around, like, uh, 75 kg. I've always been 75 kg. I'm trying to move up to 82s, but I don't... Welcome. Welcome. I don't, I don't tell anyone that, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for all inclusive purposes, I'm trying to stay at 75. But um, a lot of work that I've been doing over the past year has been trying, you know, to eat because everyone says it and it's because it's true. It is the most important element of Mm -hmm. making gains, you know, making progress in the gym, I should say. Um, So, I mean, like a lot of things that I've been working on is like keeping a a base diet kind of uh, based around when I was going to lift in the day, which I feel like is something really important that people don't really touch on as much as I would think they should. Um... I, you know, later in the episode, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I personally uh, try to base my meals, like the the nutrition within the meals around when I'm going to be working out, when I'm going to be exerting that energy versus, you know, at night. And I'll kind of base my meals mainly around like stuff that's really like <sighs> easy to digest carbs earlier in the day, just so I could, you know, have some, some fuel to be working out like that kind of means for me, I eat a lot of pasta, I eat a lot of bagels, and I eat a lot of pasta and bagels. Yeah. I think <laughs> no, like those are the the two that I like eat all the, the time. Those are two of the best ones, but that can kind of go into like diet tips. So uh so I feel like whether or not you're going if you're bulking, maintaining, or cutting, that's the the biggest thing to consider. What what is your main goal? So I when you're looking at it through the eyes of a student, The biggest thing is figuring out when you could lift, like as Brendan was saying, the timing of it. When can you lift Uh, regarding classes? If you work, when is that uh, an available option for you? And then scheduling your meals around that. So let's Monday is my busiest day regarding school and lifting. So what I really try to do is get the biggest meal possible in the morning. So I'll, I'll eat like six hard boiled eggs. Some hash browns, uh, bagel, just carb, easy to digest carbs, but also making sure I get a lot of protein in because I know throughout the day when I'm in class or when I'm about to lift, I'm not going to have time to get that food in. So getting the biggest breakfast in and then right before, like after class, before I work out, I'll either do like Chipotle or I'll go home and try to have like another protein source, just less so. And again, a complex, not a comp, a simple carb that breaks down easily and digests easily. So you can go class, get something nice in your system, lift, and then you're good to go for the rest of the day. Yeah, it's something as somebody, you know, in all transparency has like anxiety issues. It really, 
you know, comes to be really difficult to uh, digest some things like in the early morning. So I kind of have to, you know, I have to compensate for that a little bit personally. And I'm just, you know, speaking my experience just in case somebody feels the same way. So that's kind of why I gear towards a little bit more of a structure that is like super protein dominant at the end of the day. Because when I get to the end of the day, it's like, then I could ingest a bunch of shit that's yeah. going to make me absolutely explode a toilet in, yeah. the mor- <laughs> in the morning. Like, that's when I'll, like, hammer down, like, uh, Fairlife 42ers okay. and, like, what else? I-, I don't know. Just any kind of meat that I could get down. Pause. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> any meat that I could scarf down. I'm, like, uh, usually I'm, like, a big steak guy. Yeah. I like steak a lot, even though it's it's kind of expensive. So I can only buy like one a week. But then I, I don't know. Ground beef's pretty fire. Uh, I kind of ate myself out of chicken. I can't I can't do chicken anymore. Looking at like again diet tips, I feel like when you're looking at somebody who's in college like us, ground beef and chicken is obviously just like the eat, ground beef, chicken, and eggs, which are already staples. But those you can get really cheap, especially if you go to somewhere like Costco. Or you go the, even to Jewel. Jewel has some pretty good. Uh, Jewel's a local uh, grocery store for us, but they that has really solid deals on that stuff. So you can get a lot of protein in, and uh, like just have that in your free freezer or fridge ready to go to eat for like a pretty solid price. You don't actually have to worry about spending too much to get these things in. That's a big thing. People worry about like, oh, I want to eat well. I want to get my pro- my macros and I want to get my protein in, but I don't have. I don't want to spend that much, but you don't really need to sometimes if you're prioritizing a strong protein source like chicken. You can get chicken pretty pretty well, pretty easily. A comp, uh, simple carb, rice. You can get a lot of rice for really cheap. Rice, even uh, depending on where you go, bagels can also be pretty cheap. Oh, and, yeah. and, uh, and then eggs. Eggs are more expensive now, but that's a, another really solid source. And regarding my experience, I'm actually, I've been bulking. And the biggest thing for me getting, I, back in March, I was 163 pounds when I competed and consistently I've been weighing at like 177 to 180 every morning. And the biggest thing that's helped me actually, which is cheap, reliable, and something that you can do consistently, which is another thing, consistency is liquid calories liquid yeah no it's not just liquid like liquid iv is a big one because you can get carbs from that from the sugar and other like uh nutrients in it but i for a long time i had a giant bottle a gallon bottle and i would put lemonade powder in it just lemonade powder water and a little bit of salt and that was big because it like instead of having to eat your calories whenever and worrying about that cooking a meal buying a meal you could just have a jug of lemonade or iced tea is another popular one and just carry that around with you, drink it throughout the day and you get your, you get a pretty solid calorie boost. So instead of having to eat an extra five to 600 calories, you can just drink it. Yeah. I'm not even going to sit here and pretend like I'm not rendering this information myself because I need it, but (laughs) I'm like literally one of the listeners right now, just ingesting this. But like, honestly, I heard some crazy shit from like, uh, different people like who will just try to get the most absurd ways going to like get in calories at the end of the day. Like Trey told me uh, that that like he knows people like some really heavy deadlift people who will just like drink like a cup of uh, it was olive yep. oil. Yep, olive oil. <laughs> so I've heard people just eating raw egg as one way just to easily get your calories. And it's like that's Bro, that's crazy. I gotta say I. I did that one time. The like raw ate, egg? Yeah, I ate a raw egg one time before the gym, and I may or may not have puked that day. Yeah, no, that gym. I can imagine. <laughs> but the, the see, the I think people will do the the olive oil thing, to like drinking teaspoons of olive oil to get the calories in. But I feel like uh, one thing they're missing out on is that's a lot of fat, and you could be getting your calories from so many other places that are more i know i was just talking about drinking lemonade but like you can get let's say the end of the day you're missing a thousand calories instead of eating a bunch of olive oil or butter which i i've eaten butter before 
but you could make a meal that's high, like using the olive oil in it or something to also then supplement the calories with other nutrients. So, oh, I need a thousand calories, but I could also get a little bit more protein or I could get more carbs with this or whatever. Like for, uh, for a while, my breakfast, I would do English muffins. I would do two English muffins and put butter on them. So you're getting a lot of calories from butter. You're getting carbs as well from the English muffin and then you're good to go. Yeah, the schmear game is low key one of the biggest biggest hacks. Like I, you gotta schmear the bagel. You gotta put like Nutella. Oh, Nutella's I mean, like, good. It it just depends on like if you want to just eat it with like if you want to schmear it, which is like the the normal civil thing to do, or if you want to eat it with a spoon. Which... I'm not. I'm not eating olive oil with a spoon. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not doing that. Nah, I, I can't even lie. I do eat peanut butter with a spoon. Eating peanut butter with a spoon is slightly different, though. Like, I would do that. I was uh, back last year when I was broke and didn't have groceries and I needed calories. I would just sit watch, like, Valor and just spooning peanut butter. But sometimes you just got to do that. But at least peanut butter is more palatable than olive oil. Yeah. I mean, I was actually going to touch on another thing because like in addition to being in school, like me and Dante both are, uh, I had a part-time job for a long while. It was like, I think I was there for like two years and it made it really tough sometimes to like get in good meals and I'd Mm -hmm. have to like completely fuck up my diet because I was going on like, I don't know, seven hour at a time shifts and uh, I had a really tough boss who didn't allow for me to like eat when I wanted to. So I would have to like, oh my God, I was going to say some other thing, but like, this is obviously going to lead me into like this abominable story. <laughs> I, I feel obligated to tell it now, tell it. but it's like <laughs> one time my, my manager, well, he inevitably caught me eating sardines in my bathroom <laughs> at oh, work Lord. because they like, they, they wouldn't let me eat on the clock. So, like, I had to, like, sneak in my meals, and I was, like, super, super, like, this is when I was, like, super anal into, like, the bulk phase. Like, well, it's not just a phase. It's a lifestyle, but... It's not a phase, mom. But I was, like, going absolutely ham on this, and I was, like, I need protein intake today, and I saw some dude on TikTok scarfing down sardines, and I was, like, you know what? I'm gonna try that at work, because, like, I knew that, like, I had to, like, try some, like absolute rat behavior type shit and i i did it and then i like toss the can in the garbage oh. my manager comes start like storming out and he's like who the fuck ate sardines in the bathroom <laughs> and i was just like sitting there like maybe oh. five feet away i was like yeah i don't know man no that's crazy i don't know <laughs> Damn, who would do crazy. that no nah, but i owned up to it just because it was so fucked that like is- Oh my god! And that's, I work at the the vitamin shop, which luckily I do not have that problem, especially because we sell so many protein snacks. That's that's pretty solid, and that's another thing I wanted to get into: protein snacks. That is a fantastic way to supplement the bulk when, like, either one you're on a time crunch with school, or you need like a cheaper option. There are some protein snacks that I do stay away from because just the ingredients in them stuff like that but there are some really high like protein like uh meat snacks like you can get basically beef jerky but it's like chicken so it's a higher protein intake uh the like uh bear bells those are really good really high protein and they actually taste good quest is always a pretty uh solid choice but those are all high protein snacks that you can just eat on the go so instead of eating sardines in the bathroom uh, you could eat sardines or these protein snacks while you're in class. Like I always make sure to pack stuff in class, especially again, Monday, Monday is my primary squat day. And, uh, just to make sure I'm getting that little bit extra intake, I'll bring a protein bar, I'll bring a snack and I'll bring whatever, or what have you just to make sure you're getting that little bit extra when you're on a time crunch. Yeah. Me personally, this kind of goes into another topic. Like, I got to talk about the fact that like I really can't lift in the morning or I should say power lift. Like I could do like accessories and all that, Mm -hmm. but like, oh man, I just have such a problem like working out in the morning because like, I don't know, my stomach just isn't ready to ingest like a giant meal when I like wake up. So like I have like minimal energy like circulating my body 
and I'll try to like go lift to a heavy day and I always get folded. Uh, for us specifically, I found that working out in the afternoon is large is actually well, it's obviously popular because people get off of work or what have you. But especially for like the power lifting scene at school and with just among us, three o'clock seems to be the go to. And I, I've noticed in myself, if I lift later or earlier, it's a little bit harder to get done or just get going. Like I, the other day I was working, I did my secondary squat day really early in the morning. And while the weight moved, it felt slower. It just felt like the bar felt heavier on my back. Uh, when I lift later after work, uh, motivation's obviously pretty low because I just finished work. It's like 12 o'clock. I want to go home. I want to go sleep because I have oh, class yeah. in the morning. So yeah. it's always like 3 o'clock is perfect, especially because you finish your lift, and then it's dinner time. Then you can get something for dinner, eat something. It's a, it seems to be the pretty optimal time, at least regarding class and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I'd have to agree. Three o'clock, four o'clock is perfect sometimes. I don't know. I think like I see the most people at five o'clock. Five o'clock, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that just in the regard that, I mean, I need to get those like at least two meals in before I go to the gym. And one of those has got to be like the pasta or bagel. Meta. Yep. One of them has, it has to be one of the two. Yeah, and I and now I wanted to go into a di another topic, kind of relating to it. Now we're talking in the scale, the scope of just general like nutrition while powerlifting in college. But now the another thing to consider is bulking versus cutting, which is a little bit more geared towards comp like competition powerlifters. Because if you're someone like myself or Brendan, Brendan is still a seventy five. I was a seventy five, and when is it? time to bulk and or cut now there's two main kind of sides to that one you could do a hard bulk like what i did i gained like 17 pounds going from 60 uh, 75 to 82 or you could hard cut so you can go straight down to a different weight class but then those are obviously very difficult but then i i found the best way to do it and to approach it and this is what aiden does and what i like my teammates do is you bulk to build functional mass, so muscle mass, a little bit of fat, that's all like functional and assisting your lifts, and then you do a slight recomp. So then you cut a little bit, which this also kind of is perfect for, for me and I find for other like collegiate athletes because you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm bulking, I need to eat so much, I need to eat all this stuff. I have to hit my 4,000 calorie goal, but I also have three classes today. You hit what you need to, you, you're bulking, whatever, and then you can do a really small cut. And then, you again, you don't have to focus, oh, I've eaten more calories, whatever. It's really like doing these small bulks and small cuts is perfect in this kind of space. Yeah, no, I mean, like, doing, like, a small cut, especially for, like, a power lifter, I, th I think, like, with our standards, a small cut, quote-unquote, would probably amount to, like, a normal person diet, and that's kind of, like, <laughs> the best part, because it's, like, a cut, which is, you know, hypothetically, it should be something that's, like, you know, worrying you or would stress you out, you know, sometimes if you're doing like a hard cut, I feel like it could really impact some parts of like some facets of your life. You could just get like super upset, super cranky all the time, mm -hmm. but we're talking like three meals a day. It's like really not going to change your life. And that's kind of, you know, the most optimal way you could go optimal. about <laughs> love using optimal, but like, it's just the best way you could go about doing things in terms of like, you know, just trying to live your normal life. Yeah. And, you know, for a lot of people, um, myself included, even though uh, I'm not going to like <laughs> pretend like I'm not that, like I'm not proficient at it, but, uh, or I'm, I'm trying to say I'm not, I'm, I am not proficient at being a good bulker and I'm not good at sticking with it. But, uh, I still think that the practice of like bulking is super fun. Just like trying to make sure that you hit like caloric diet, like, not, not restrictions, but goals. It's like, I don't know. It's fun to live your life like that. Uh, it's why I chose this lifestyle, the powerlifting lifestyle. I the, mean, I mean, it's fun, but it's also important to remember that you don't want to build 
non-functional mass because that's when you get to a point where you're eating so much and instead of supplementing your workouts and building muscle mass you're in again functional mass you're starting to then just build fat and you're eating too much and you're in too much of a caloric uh like surplus to where it's no longer benefiting you and if anything it's holding you back so that's an important thing you're not like just oh i'm a power lifter i'm going to eat whatever i want all the time no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm all, sure there's many people who would beg to differ. Oh, sh- yeah, but all the yeah, haters, all the haters. But also, yeah, we have friends. I, I have friends who like did super hard cuts, eating like two thousand calories a day, and not even like not less than two thousand calories a day, and it impacted their mood a lot. It impacted their lifts substantially because you're just losing so much mass. Uh, it impacted just how they were like they were eating, uh, just how they were able to live their life, and if it's just contributing more stress than it needs to in a lot of cases. So instead of like just doing what's best for you, what you're at, you know, the level you're at, your competition, your lifts, it just takes away from all that. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I've been oh my god, I have to put the air quotes just for the people who don't have the video. Um, I have been bulking for two years now, so I don't even know, like, what the prospect of cutting would be like at this point in my life. Because, like, I, you know, surprise, surprise, uh, started skinny. So um, I've never really had any obligation to cut. So I can't really speak too much on, like, what it's like being somebody who has the obligation to cut and, you know, cut down to a certain weight. I, I have found for myself, since I'm not trying to, like, be... I'm, I'm just trying to stay where I'm at. So, like, the 177 to 180 range, 179 range, uh, is where I try to stay most of the time. So, what I largely do is I eat a perfect amount to stay in that range. And if I find that I'm starting to get too close to 180 or I even go above 180... That's when I scale back a little bit. Mm. So instead of instead of eating that protein bar or instead of eating that uh, like like extra little bit of pasta, I'll just cut back on that. And then I find I go back down to like the 178 range, which is where I want to stay. So it's just like it's I'm not hard cutting. I'm not hard uh, bulking anymore. It's just stay, doing it like at the almost at the same time. Like one day. I'm eating a lot of calories to make sure like I'm fueled and I'm ready to go. And then another day I'm like, okay, this morning I woke up a little bit heavier. I should just watch myself today. And then I, because also like there's so much variability between like the, those pounds. It could be water weight. That could be whatever. I could have eaten a little bit too late and I didn't digest it well, stuff like that. And there's so many factors regarding it. Yeah, no, I, that would be a dream for me to be (laughs) able to like wake up and be like, yeah, I I probably shouldn't eat as much today, dude. Oh, my God. I like I the one thing that I lack the most as a power lifter is an appetite. I have the pussiest stomach known to man. Sometimes and I'm not I'm not just joking. You have to just force yourself to eat sometimes. Oh, yeah. I I find that my uh, my diet just disappeared. Not my diet. My appetite is just gone. So what do I do? I bust out the water glass. The water glass? The water glass. Uh, like competition eaters, like hot dog eaters, whatever, We they will eat and then they'll take a drink of water to allow it to go down faster. And sometimes if I can't eat, I'll literally, I'll do that so that I'm able to, I force myself to eat a little bit. And then the night, like as you force yourself to eat, then your appetite catches up and you're able to then restore your appetite. That happens a lot with my coach. Like he'll say, my appetite's just gone, but I've I've lost weight and I need to gain weight so I can be like competitive at nationals. Uh, let's say. So he would literally just force himself to eat. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much a day in the life for me. I think I like. Uh, well, I don't want to say like the water strategy because it's like I don't know if it's the same for me because I'll just use like whatever drink I have on tap or. Not on tap. Oh my god, why did I say that? But like any drink I have in the fridge, like an energy drink, anything. Mm-hmm. I'll like I need to have a bev with me because that's like when I'm like towards the end of my meal and it's like cause I eat a lot of like carbs. 
And like me personally, I just like I'll start like hiccuping if I like get to like that point mm-hmm. in my meal. It's like I need to have the bev next to me. Mm-hmm. So I'll like bev. I'll just like you know I'll be dual wielding and shit until <laughs> I like I finish up the meal and you know I I do what I gotta do. But I don't know. It's like my stomach just does not not like me. And I don't I don't want to sit here and make excuses. I really don't. But man, I'm just distraught, guys. So honestly, what what might help with with that is f- like almost gaslighting your stomach. <laughs> oh my god! Like, you gotta elaborate on that. So basically, what I used to do is I still do this. I'll make like smoothies or smoothie bowls, and so it's fruit, fair life, protein powder. That's basically it, and I'll add granola on top. Whatever that doesn't matter. What that does matter? Fire. It's good, but the gaslighting part comes in. You go back to the olive oil. You put the <laughs> olive oil. A little bit, just a little bit in the smoothie, not so that it like it won't affect the taste depending on how much you put in there, but it will be there. Mm-hmm. And so you're you're eating it. It's like, wow, I'm having this nice meal, whatever, small meal. It's a small smoothie bowl, but there's there's <laughs> the calories in there. You're adding just a little bit extra calories. So it's like a way of almost gaslighting yourself into eating more calories. <laughs> it all comes back to the olive oil, guys. That's the that's the number one hack. You have no idea how many bottles of olive oil I've gone through. Just be, just because I cook with it, but I always make sure to put a little bit too much olive oil in the pan because I'll, you cook with the olive oil, oil, it like evaporates, but it gets into the food, making it a little bit more calorically dense, and it works. Man, I mean, like that, like that brings me to like the topic of like calorie tracking i don't know if, if you're down to go into I'm this because it's like work. it's a long ass talk but like stuff like that makes it so difficult to track calories and that's why i've been like on and off like i'm not even gonna sit here and lie to you guys like i've been on my bullshit when it comes to tracking calories but it's like it's so hard to maintain that kind of thing because it's like dude do you re- like oh my god it's like such a pain in the ass if you want to like eat a bag of like chips or something and then like like bag them up in saran wrap and like put them on a scale (laughs) it's like (laughs) see i i never do that with with snacks uh i only measure out uh my meals like my big meals so breakfast i'll uh today i had six hard-boiled eggs and um some hash browns so i'll measure that stuff out and i'll track that stuff but if I'm eating like a few chips or if I'm eating a an one Oreo, I'm not tracking that because there's one, there's already so much uh, room, for like uh, room for error there because it's like it's one Oreo. There's so much variability in the actual calories and the actual nutrients, whatever. And also it's it's a negligent amount. One chip or a few chips, whatever, is going to be very low in calories to the point where like you can think about it at the end of the day. So like I'll let's say I have four meals and I track those four meals and let's say I'm a few calories off. It's like, okay, what else have I eaten today that I didn't track? And then largely it just goes into it. You just are able to kind of guesstimate. It's like, okay, I'm towards my calorie goal. Yeah. And you just toss it in and it's like, you know, if you didn't make it, it's like, oh, yeah, but yeah. I did, but I did eat that one Oreo earlier. So that should like amount for like so and so amount yeah. of calories. But I don't know. Me, like me personally, that's low key why I, like a large reason that I just eat so robotically is because I have plugged in like all the numbers mm-hmm. and like in terms of, uh calories and protein all that kind of stuff and like i'll just like have that baseline with like all the foods that i usually eat and i'll just like stick to it because like i have a general idea in my head like if i get this and this within my diet like i'll be able to meet my protein intake goal like my calorie goal so like it's it it almost like boxes you in sometimes because it makes you not want to like eat the the foods that are like outlandish or like try new things because it's like i could just eat like this portion of pasta and that'll be like that'll amount for whatever amount of carbs calories whatever you may yeah uh a a big thing with that especially i i I like that you brought up like oh i don't want to eat this new thing because i don't know 
the calories, carbs, fats, protein, whatever. But I think, one, it is, like, while it's not exact, you can't always look that up. And two, uh, that's a trap I feel like a few people, like, a lot of people fall into. It's like, oh, this doesn't, I don't know what protein is in this. Uh, I need, I, I still need blah, blah, blah. And so I'm not going to eat this. I'm going to eat what I always eat. And, uh, your like nutri nutrition and powerlifting is not, it's strict, but in a not strict way. Oh yeah. That's that like a perfect way of explaining it's it. It's not, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it, that sounds very convoluted, but like, let's say I, I'm 180 pounds and a lot of people follow the, Oh, one gram of protein for every, uh, pound of body fat. So it's like, Oh, I need to eat. 180 pounds uh, not pounds grams of protein today but that's not necessarily true all the time the, there's more so a range that you could follow which is i believe it's like uh anywhere from like 85 percent to like the full 100 percent. so like yeah uh you could eat 180 grams of protein but at one point at what point is there diminishing returns where it's no longer beneficial. Like, sure, you could also go and eat 220 grams of protein that day. How much is that actually going to help you? So largely, it's like, okay, I'm 180 pounds. I would like to eat close to 180 grams of protein. But if I'm at 165, 170, even 190, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to worry about exactly hitting that number. The number itself isn't what matters. It's the fact that you are getting into that range. The range is what is important. Yeah, it's just like a general estimate for people who are like not super, super scientific and like know the exact variables at play. But like, I feel like once you like overdo, well, it's not overdue because it's like, you know, it's not a horrible thing if you you know, end up eating over your protein goal. I'd say like for someone like me, that's always going to be like a good thing yeah. because me personally, I need to bulk. But I think that a lot of those, those nutrients just kind of translate into fat at that point when you hit that influx kind of area. I don't know. I could be wrong. I could and be wrong. Also, there's a, the the fact that just because you're getting your calories and your calories, your protein, your, your macros, all that, doesn't necessarily mean you're doing yourself any favors where instead of, okay, I need 3000 calories. So I'm going to eat three Big Macs and I got my calories for the day. There you go. Well, how much is that actually helping you in the long run? Not the answer is not much. So instead of prioritizing the actual calorie number, it's about actually eating a sizable amount while getting your protein in by getting carbs in and fats, but from healthy sources so brown rice white rice mangoes uh even pastas and some complex carbs there it's very important that you're actually eating well rather than eating for the number so especially like also a lot of people i know don't eat vegetables you're not really getting calories or whatever from those but you still need to eat vegetables and fruits. Like, like <laughs> I let's just hate remember the way that. that you looked at me when I'm you not, said I'm that. Not targeting, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'm not trying to target, but like, yeah, you need to eat properly. And that's where a lot of people fall off. And I mean, I did too. It's like, oh, I need 3,300 calories and I'm a little bit off. So I'm going to eat a hamburger or cheeseburger from wherever. And it's like, or you could do a little bit more effort. Do, take away from the number a little bit, but make sure you're eating from like actually nutritional sources. Yeah. I mean, like, I feel like it was inevitable that I was going to bring this up today because I just was watching him all last night. But this just reminds me of like, have you ever watched Togi? You, you had Togi on when we did like a group like hangout. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I watched him again last night and I just like realized that there are certain ways that people live their lives that literally I think would, would kill me. Like, I, Oh yeah. He was yeah. like the way that he was going about his day. Like he just like, he did like a little podcast thing. Not that long ago. It was like called podcast with the voices, dude. And that's kind of low key me, me and the, Dante right now, the voices <laughs> Get, stay in the box. No, but, uh, yeah, no, he, uh, was talking about like, well, he like casually brought up the fact, first of all, that he in took, like he was, 
I'm paced to intake 600 milligrams of caffeine in that day. And that's like regular day for him. Not to mention he blasts Trent or he stopped blasting Trent, but he's on a vicious fucking cycle of tests. He does fucking coke. And what? it's like, actually, that doesn't surprise me. And it's like, uh, this is the type, like, I, I know that y'all are thinking right now, like, how is this relevant? But I just kind of got reminded that when Dante brought up, like, you know, eating Big Macs and like a bunch of garbage for like, you know, calories, it's like, you got to factor in the fact that like, how do you walk around and like live like that when you like, you, mm-hmm. you're just going to feel like garbage. Like, I'm sure I could like knock out like two Big Macs at night and like get my calories in or whatever but i'm gonna feel like i'm gonna feel like garbage and like i can't do it like during the day it's no, like no. if i'm like about to work out about to like go do something productive like i can't do that because i'm just yeah. gonna be like walking around and be like i'm gonna be dead yeah i mean we i have a joke with uh with some friends where it's like the the bi-weekly pizza allowance <laughs> It is so like every two weeks I'm allowed one pizza because I know that once I eat that pizza, sure I'm gonna get a lot of calories in, but I'm gonna feel horrible. So one, I never do it before a primary day. So like I'll do it maybe Wednesday because Thursday is like quaternary bench or something. But like I like Brendan brings up a good point. Sure, you could eat that, but you're going to feel really bad. And then you see someone like Sean Noriega with Nori, and his plate, oh, my God, he eats so well, so well. And Mm -hmm. it shows. It shows in, like, his everyday training performance. Yeah, I mean, like, I I was talking about real life, but honestly, we could translate this all the way into lifting because it's like, Man, if I'm about to, like, do, like, oh, my God, I'm about to do, like, a uh, heavy squat, like, single today, what am I going to eat before I go there? Is it really going to be that Big Mac or whatever? Like, that is going to fuck me. I'm about to, like, all right, first of all, I'm going to fart on the way back up. Oh, that, yeah. That's one thing that's, that's going to give you a bo- It's going to give you a boost. <laughs> all right, well, that booster. might be a little optimal, <laughs> but, like, uh I'm like, I I just don't even know if I'm going to make it to like that top rep. If I have something that garbage in my system, it's probably going to like, I'm going to be at like my last warm up, my LWU, Lord forgive me, I'm about to LWU. LWU. Uh, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be like, fuck this. I'm quit. Like, I'm not going to do it today. It's like, I'm I'm not feeling it. So it's like, it translates everywhere. It's not just training. Or, I mean, it's not just the real world. It's training, too. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to have that dog in you, though. Sometimes. But I, eating poorly before a lift does always feel worse, especially on those heavier days, on the worst, like, the, the harder days. Like, uh, Friday is probably my most difficult day mentally. And I, I know if I ate poorly, too, or had something like a Big Mac or McDonald's or whatever – before then it would just make it even harder to get through that day yeah it's like it oh my god i i just like i just know i'm gonna get memed on for talking about endurance and powerlifting <laughs> but i was gonna say it's like you gotta be able to make it through the whole session with all the compounds like two hours i know people are gonna come at, come at me and say like oh y'all are lazy as fuck but no, fuck, no that's that's just not even true all right i know i know it's not true oh, but yeah. it's like I'm, I feel biased because I am a power lifter. But I mean, I feel like we're pretty good examples. I mean, me and you, we're both pretty, pretty skinny. Just like. Did you just call me skinny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, well, you started skinny. I did start. I started skinny fat. My ass was skinny fat. Yeah. But, but yeah. Point being, it's like people can be fit and not just like a fat piece of shit power lifting. And. That's, no, no shade to anybody who's out there powerlifting and is fat. That's not, it's not what I meant. It's just the the stereotype is that you just sit there and be a fat piece of shit and eat Sour Patch Kids while you lift. And I don't know. It's fun to lean into that stereotype. Don't get me wrong. It is. Like I'm saying here, like saying like, oh no, we're so like badass. We fucking you know we have crazy endurance that we have to maintain. But it is nice and it's fucking fun to like sit back and like yap with your friends during a session. But I mean, you do need a, a solid level of endurance, not necessarily cardiovascular endurance. That's not what we're talking about. I can't run with shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like you need endurance and muscular endurance in order to get through those sets. Like if I have 
I have a, on uh, Thursday, no, Friday, I have a set of four at like usually five and a half RP, and then another set of four at six and a half RP, and then back down, like a set of six and a half, or not to, a set of six, and then a two by six at a lower RP. Like you need a solid muscular endurance to get through that. And then after that, I have pause Bulgarian split, split squats with my foot, my front foot elevated. Uh, and that, like, if you're don't, if you don't have the endurance for it and you don't have the diet to support that, you're, it's going to be way harder to finish a lift like that. I think you might've done something to Aiden Raider to have him program you. Then. I don't, I, I ask myself that every day, what did I do to Aiden to, to have to do that? And then on i uh, on Saturdays, my primary bench day, I have a comp single and then close grip set of eight. Oh, it's touch and go luckily, but it's close grip eight at like RP eight and then back downs at like two by eight. Uh, close grip, touch and go. Like what? what Aiden, what did I do to you? <laughs> you looked what, right in the I, camera. I'm, 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 talk, I'm talking to to Aiden if he's watching this. What did I do? But also, <laughs> like I, I'm jokingly complaining about it. But I was talking to him about it recently. But those pause Bulgarians have done so much for me. It's not even joking. So like that's a that's a staple. Whenever I'm programming for two of my athletes, I'm always giving them pause. Like not pause. I'm giving them regular Bulgarians. Yeah, no. I mean, I'm just memeing for for full disclosure, but like I actually have been programmed Bulgarians recently and it's been actually super, super helpful for me, but in a different way. Like obviously, uh, aesthetically, I have a ways to go. So like that's usually what you think when you think about Bulgarians is like, you know, making the gains on the quads. But really, it's helped me a lot because I had an injury with my left leg for, man, it had to have been since like late September I've been dealing with it of, of last year. And um, I always had like a weaker left leg and kind of like an imbalance going on. It never really impacted my squat that much somehow. But like whenever I do like it was a uh, well, Bulgarians, obviously. And then like, uh, what was it? It was hack squat. I just couldn't do either of those movements for, for whatever reason. So Like when I started like really hammering down Bulgarians and like, you know, getting my form correct, because, you know, that is another uh, aspect of that that I really had to lock in on because like I would do them, but I'd like, I don't want to say like half ass them, but I just didn't do them right. And now that I've been like actually like making a great focus point out of it. Uh, in terms of like my accessories, obviously my main focus points always going to be the compounds, but like, I don't know, like, really honing in and like trying to make them good. I feel like it's really been diminishing, you know, the weakness that's I've, I've had going on in my left leg. Pause. But oh, in regular Bulgarian split squats are genuinely the greatest thing ever. They suck. And I hate doing them with a burning passion, but also they have helped so much with imbalances with, uh, as, as you were saying with imbalances, but also with, just general like stability. My left leg had zero balance. Like I tried doing uh, 65s the first week I had them, and I I was falling over. And now the balance is there, which translates to regular comp squat. Wait, hold on. Did you say you were just 65s for the Bulgarians? Yeah. Two 65s. Two 65s. Oh my god. Kathleen, uh, one of our teammates uh, on DePaul powerlifting, was using 80s. That's oh more than she weighs. <laughs> why am I not? Why am I not surprised? She, though? But she's also insane because she loves them. Like she, she was doing them. She's like, I love these so much. And I'm like, did you get hit in the head as a child? Like <laughs> <laughs> this one's this one's for the girl Kathleen. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We're using the same. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Add the applause on there. I had yeah, to no. use it. I, I'm working my way up back. Like I tried seventies. Um. And I could get the, I could get them with my right leg, but I couldn't get with them with my left leg because I start I was just falling over. So now that my balance is starting to come uh, come around on my left leg, I can actually start pushing them. But instead of a lot of times, instead of going up in weight, I just hammer the pause even more, like at almost two count pause on the the like the at the bottom, and 
they do afterwards. Oh my God. My legs get so pumped. I genuinely can't walk like normally. Are we talking like aesthetic pump or like, what are we, what are we talking here? No, just my legs are pumped up. It's awesome. So yeah, yeah, no. So a good, a good kind a of pump. Good, good kind of pump. And I just cannot, like, I literally look like I was like beat up because I can't walk normally. Nah. Uh, or dicked down. Yeah, sure. Thank you. For, <laughs> yeah. I was trying to not say that. <laughs> I was trying to make you say that. Yeah, I know you were. <laughs> you asshole. But uh, no, it's, that dude, just thinking about doing those again. Oh my God. Yeah. But the, again, they they help so much. But the, going going into the actual dieting, I again I know if I ate poorly because like those already make me nearly throw up. If I ate poorly and had something bad in my stomach, I'm going to throw up. Dude, like this this just reminds me. Like I know you've seen like all the clips of like people like either not just throwing up but like passing out on deadlift. Has that shit like almost or ever happened to you? Mm, no, mm. it's happened to me before on bench, but not on deadlifts before. Yeah, Georgie got me with a great clip of me. Like, I think I did like a, a heavy double and I was just like iron deficient as fuck that day. And uh, she like, uh, well, she was just next to me and I was recording it. And she, she like flipped the camera, like she took the camera and like put it on me. And I was just like sitting on the, well, obviously the people that, you know, are just listening, can't see this, but I was just like, <laughs> it looks like you were on like hard off Fent. Yeah. yeah it, it looks like I just overdosed on Fent. Like I actually thought that I was going to pass out in the middle mm-hmm. of the gym. It's always me with like the CNS issues, man. Like I like right when I first started working with Kevin, who's my coach, I like had to take like a two week break because I got CNS fatigue. I remember from, like, that. I was I was going so goddamn hard and like I, I remember it was because I did like a heavy squat day. I was running the Candido for mm-hmm. I don't know Dante. You know what that means? Yeah, I don't. Do I know what Candido is? Does Dante know what the Candido <laughs> is? But yeah, no. Uh, for those of you who know, it's like a really really good squat program. I highly recommend it to people who are like looking for an in on powerlifting. It's like perfect if you're like looking for an in. It's like all the answers to being a good squatter in my opinion. But point being, it's really hard. I just did like a full day of that. And the thing about it is that you get to like you get some leverage in choosing your accessories. Like you'll choose like a couple that you really like and it'll like scatter it throughout like the spreadsheet. So Mine of the day, well, I don't even know if it was. I think my friend just peer pressured me into like doing these crazy ass drop sets on, uh, it was leg press. And I was doing that crazy shit because like I was in the gym with like, uh, I think three of my other friends. So I had the resources at the time to do this. They were like doing the suicides on me where I'd like load the plates, do a full set. They'd take them off. I'd do another set and I'd just like keep going until I'd like, tap out and me tapping out was me getting a cns fucking fatigue like i like felt something shoot down my neck and i just like was dead the whole rest of the day and i went i went like uh i think it was like two weeks where i just like whenever i'd get under something like get under a bar or try to lift it like i specifically remember i tried to get under like 275 for like one of my last warm-ups and like as soon as i applied pressure on the bar i just like was a shooting pain so point of the story uh i know y'all are out there saying that cns is fake it's real guys it's real i don't think people deny the cns existing but you know what <laughs> Dude, <laughs> you know what they're it's my the hate. haters it's the haters but yeah I think that just also can go into like the stress of training and managing that because obviously Candido's program is brutal. Both you and Kathleen um, ran it. I I don't remember how often she did, but or how long she did. That makes so much fucking sense, dude. I should have known because she's the biggest squat specialist. She's a very big squat specialist and almost, I think her deadlift is starting to pull away, but for a while her deadlift was like basically the same as her squat. Uh, But that's just, that's a common thing with Candido's programming in general, because I know um, 
a few power lifters in the area who are very good squatters ran Candido's, but also their deadlift is basically the same. It's almost like Candido's, uh, like the theory behind it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, disclosure, just, you know, if we were a bigger podcast, I probably would refrain from saying this, but um, no, I'm saying that shit with my chest. It's like the whole point of it is that if your squat is like, if your squats going up, your deadlift is going up, but historically that's not true. <laughs> because you're, the deadlift is more, especially if you're doing conventional, it's a lot of hamstrings, glutes, and low back. With quads, uh, obviously, but the squat is mostly quads. So you need to develop them separately. Mm-hmm. And Candido's just doesn't do that. That's why everybody like I know who's ran it has troubles with their deadlift. Yeah, I mean, it's not even like discrete in the program. It's like he just kind of neglects deadlift as a compound mu- movement. In general and it's like he just kind of has it so it's like you have a couple good like deadlift days another problem i have with it is like that you do it on the squat day consistently which is nuts yeah. like w- w- no yeah no. i get it for like an sbd day like once a week but that's not what it is but in addition to that it's not even just like the deadlift it's like guys i'm gonna be honest because i like shouted out the candido program as a good resource for like people who are just getting into powerlifting. It is, but for squat, don't listen to the bench part of it either. Like the bench part's not good. It's a very, very, very good squat introduction. Squat. That's where the the sentence ends. (laughs) Yeah, it's like for bench, uh, I was always just figuring something else out. Um, Deadlift, I, you know, my intro to powerlifting, I... I'm not gonna lie, I kind of neglected deadlifts a little bit because I was a little scaredy cat and I didn't want to like fuck up my back or something, which I mean, you know, is a valid concern. I mean, it's like a lot of people can get into lifting and like want to pull something crazy and, you know, just shittily try to do like 315 and like toss out their back. But I don't know, it, it was a valid concern, but like it's so essential, even if like, you're not a power lifter. You should be deadlifting, whether it's just like heavy, probably not heavy deadlifts for you, but like as long as you're doing doing, doing like a volume set for deadlifts, it's like it's going to benefit you De- a lot. Deadlifts are one of the best exercises to do for the low body in general. And the low back thing is sometimes valid, but also not really anymore because the biggest thing was people are like, oh, your back's rounding. You're going to break your spine. If you're deadlifting properly, one, you're going to have some sort of flexion, either the upper back, the low back. Sometimes, not even sometimes, when I'm deadlifting, my upper back is flexed on purpose to leverage your, myself better. So it's required. And two, a, a long time ago, a long time ago, it was under, it was believed to be understood that if your back flexes in the deadlift or just in general, it's bad and your back can't do that. But more recent studies have shown that f- flexion in the spine is nothing different than flexion in the knee. When you're walking, your knee flexes, it bends. Nobody's like saying, oh, you need to walk with your knees straight. No, because that's not how it works. Your spine is built to ha- withstand flexion. Am I saying you should deadlift with your back and let it like crane over? No, but it's going to happen and there's no point stressing about it. Yeah, it's just it's just the approach. I mean, obviously in saying that I didn't deadlift, I'm not saying like obviously, yeah, I was trying to just defend myself a little bit, but like <laughs> don't do what I did, okay? Don't be a, a bitch and don't deadlift because it could benefit you a lot. It's just you have to go about it the right way in the sense that you can't let ego take over where it's a lot more delicate than it is with like bench where it's like not the end of the world. If you like, you know, try to ego lift a little bit, it's like with bench and squat, you could kind of like cheat and, you know, like half rep, do whatever the hell you you do. But like deadlift, it's like if the weight's too heavy for you and you try to like your ego gets in the way and you're like trying to do it anyway, that's when you could get hurt. So it's like if when you're implementing deadlift, you maybe want to like, you know, go a little bit more low weight, high volume, just so you could get the form down and, you know, the swing of things. But 
Yeah. I, w- I would argue almost the squat and ego lifting is almost worse because the sc- deadlifting, if you load something on the bar that you can't lift, the bar is not going to leave the floor. <laughs> it's yeah, not- no, sometimes. But like, you know, your primal it- instinct can kick in and be like, you know, having you do all the shit that is going to get you hurt. It, that is true. But uh, on the side of like the squat, if you, you can... You unrack the squat and you start to go down and your body, one, isn't balanced well enough to hold it, and two, you're just not strong enough to even descend the squat, you can really get hurt, especially because, again, the deadlift, you're pulling upwards. You're, the bar needs to leave the ground. The squat, that bar is going down because gravity is a thing. And so you can, like, ego lifting on the squat and the bend, even on the bench, is sometimes worse than the deadlift. Yeah, man. That kind of honestly brought me back a little bit to the days of like when squatting was a new exercise for me. It looked like when before you started talking about it, I was like not even realizing what it was like back when I was first squatting because it was it, Loki was scary for me yeah. when I was like doing that shit at first. I only I was only SSB squatting for like a year and even then I didn't squat i was like one of the leg press demons uh because i was i was more scared to squat than i was to deadlift because again the deadlift if you can't lift the weight sure you could get off the ground or whatever but it it's it's on the ground you can't like it's not like a snatch where you're gonna lift it up and then it's gonna fall on you no so it's it's very different and yeah even going looking at bench if you're ego lifting one likely you're not even going to be able to unrack it and if you can unrack it if you don't have a spotter or safeties that's when it's like that's when you see people who don't use the clips so the weight just falls off but just don't don't do that don't ego lift no I'm just don't kidding. don't no don't ego lift that's stupid no <laughs> ego lift guys don't listen to them <laughs> no, ego lifting is good for you <laughs> do you know who used to ego lift who my ass do you know where it got you? me yeah Got you pretty far. Not really. <laughs> my deadlift like didn't move for a solid amount of time. Yeah. My squat only moved because I wasn't squatting before. Yeah, I mean, I was only partially joking, but like honestly, ego lifting is so much worse for power lifters than it is for bodybuilders, in my humble opinion, because ego can get you off program. Like, that's like the first thing that like ego can do for you is like when you have a big ego. You're going to like look at your program and see like all these low RPEs and be like, nah, fuck that. I'm maxing out today because I'm like, I'm him. Don't that's, do that. That's You're what not gets him. you. That's what gets you really fucked. So that, it's like, that dog in you is taking a nap. You're not him. <laughs> but it's like you really don't need to be doing all that. It's like I don't know why people have it in their minds that they need to get like a PR on a set like set day. It's like what's going to happen? Are you going to fucking die tomorrow or st- well, actually just, maybe you could, but <laughs> it's it's very much people like powerlifters who just aren't focused on competing very much. They because in powerlifting, the biggest thing is putting the total on the platform. You can hit a gym PR total, whatever, but that's not that's not what wins the like a meet. That's not what wins a, an event. Sure, it looks good, like oh man, I'm in the gym and I just hit whatever. But do you, was is that going to translate it to uh, to a meet? But like Dante, I could get the bitches. No, you can't. <laughs> but they don't know that I you squat need, 405. You you need a personality to get the hose. You can't <laughs> you, bigger muscles is not going to is not going to help that much. No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> but um yeah, it, the going off program like that is just w- like it kills momentum. It absolutely just destroys like it's the the Aiden Ryder, the chain. You need to each session is a chain. And you need to build a healthy, strong chain link between each session. And let's say one day you overshoot really bad, whether it was uh, an accident or not, whatever. Now that chain starts to break down, and that's when momentum falls apart. And when you're th- thinking about powerlifting specifically, what matters more? Hitting a squat PR uh, for your week four 
or building momentum into the meet to hit the PR there where it actually counts. Nobody's going to be like, oh, but I hit 435 in training, so I should win. Nope, you didn't do it on meet day. You lose. Well, they will be like that depending on who you meet. Well, but, yeah. But, but bro, but, I'm stronger than you. I hit it I hit it in training. I hit it on the Kabuki deadlift bar with pound plates, so I'm stronger than you. No, you're not. Sorry. Yeah. It's just like the biggest lift. I know we're getting kind of off topic here, but like yeah. the biggest lift that is really, really essential. Well, actually, this is debatable. Deadlift is like kind of one that you could slip away with like saying I got it in training. It's pretty much the same thing. But like you have to hit a squat and a bench in comp or it really doesn't count. Like it doesn't hold as much merit because it's like you have official reps like counting the depth. Or, uh, well, I mean, I guess you could say bench too. There's elbow depth now, but depending like, on where you're at, yeah, yeah. But um, bench is a big one because it's like the pauses and shit. It's like if you could hit it in comp, you could pretty much hit it anywhere because it like comes down to the variables of like these random. Pe- well, sometimes they're not random people to you, but like usually random refs where you don't know what's gonna go on. You don't know how long they're gonna like give you until the pause command yeah. is up and so, or the rep can you switch it to me yeah pause your bench <laughs> i'm sick and tired of seeing people who like t- just tap it and go up it's like that is not gonna not gonna fly and but, I, you see it a, a lot especially like that's especially good advice for people who have not competed and in, intend to compete because and, doing that in your training is going to guarantee you that you're going to have a bench that's like 20 pounds lighter than what you might have thought yeah uh, a lot of times like you see people who just like oh i'm not competing so it doesn't matter and i i don't think it's very underestimated how much pausing actually does for muscular growth because the eccentric you bring the bar down your that's where your chest the muscles in your pecs are most stretched and when you hold it there, that means the stretch and the the actual work you're doing is increased. So let's say you're, you're bodybuilding, right? Sure, reps do matter a lot. So that's why they just like go up and down, whatever. The reps is what counts. But if you're a power lifter and you have three reps in a set and you're trying to maximize the work you're doing in the session, pausing it is one of the best ways to do that. Because you, like you, let, you have a, a set of three and then a three by five, whatever. You only actually get like a very small amount of reps to do. And w- doing those pauses, doing that work is uh, going to allow it to one, show up on the platform better, and just allow it, you to get the most out of that session. Yeah. And also, you, you know, reinforces the principles that you need to have when it's like having it pause because it took me a really long while. Like, even after, I don't know if it was before my second meet, I think it was, but. Like, before my first meet, I didn't even understand how to properly have a pause bench and, like, maintain tension and everything because, like, me personally, I just, like, when I do pause reps, I'd, like, let it die on my chest and then push it back up. And I'd get away with it a lot of the time because the weight I would be using is, like, kind of light for me. And then I got on the platform and then, you know, started working with some weight that was, like, decently heavy for me. And it doesn't, and like, I'll tell you now, it doesn't fly if you, like, let that shit just die on your chest. Mm-hmm. Like, you're going to you're gonna get fucked. So, yeah. like, it, it really teaches you good principles about, like, you know, maintaining tension throughout the whole rep. And additionally, like, when I first started training to, like, be a power lifter or novice power lifter, whatever you want to call me, uh, the first thing my coach told me when I, like, first started training with him was forget about touch and go that shit doesn't matter anymore. It's like, it, it's like a whole different world with bench. It's like that touch and go shit that you were doing before. It's like, don't, don't worry about it anymore. That's yeah. not a, well, it is a thing. Sometimes I've done some blocks where like I had like a quaternary bench that was like touch and go close grip or whatever. Yeah. But I have a, like the touch and go close grip set of eight on my primary bench day. And the, everything else has to be paused well, because also if you're competing, it just, allows you to not have to worry about the pauses the judge judges give. So if you have a strict judge and they pa- have you pause for a long time, if you're already pausing in training, 
that's not going to actually matter that much. You don't actually have to worry about it as much because you're used to doing that. And also, at first, it might seem like, oh, pause bench or like pausing the bench down there is really, really hard. But very quickly, it just catches up because your body, your muscles, your uh, just your musculature just gets used to holding those positions for so long to where it doesn't actually matter as much. Yeah. I mean, it's just muscle memory at some point. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're doing a super, super long pause bench, that's when it's going to actually differ. <laughs> but if you're doing like a one count pause bench, like a strict one count pause bench versus a strict like two count pause bench, it's after a while, it's going to be a very similar number. Yeah, no, it's just like you get into that that kind of area where <laughs> tempo benches come into the conversation. That's when it gets really tough. That's when you need to like amend your. Oh my god, dude! Like sometimes tempo bench for me feels like I'm uh, like deep sea diving. I like have to hold my breath so fucking ver- ferociously. Yeah, no, it's po- like tempo bench is just an interesting variation that I don't see very often. Be it- it's it's mostly seen with like really high arch benchers, or uh, benchers with uh, lower capacity like top end loads. But whatever. Um, uh, are there any other topics you want to touch on? I feel like we really diverted, but I think we covered everything in our notes. Yeah, no, we we initially did all the the fitness and like nutrition and stuff, we, and then then we kind of got into like different stuff different like variables of of powerlifting that kind of pertain to like social aspects but you know be it as it may some some important stuff yeah uh that's i feel like that kind of wraps up what we were talking about yeah Uh, i say it's a decent stopping point for us today you know uh as always uh we enjoy you guys or we super super appreciate you guys coming in as usual um on the gravel, uh, good morning hockey. Also on the network, we're really happy to be here. Um, really sad to not have Georgie in today. Obviously, mm. that was a killer. But uh, new episodes every Sunday. We we keep that shit coming. Um, we have some exciting stuff planned, and we're happy to have you guys here with us. So yeah. we'll let you go for the day. Have an amazing Sunday, and yeah. we'll yeah. see you guys next time. Yeah, thank you very much.